members, which include Lynn Marsh and Linda Valentine and Jay Crowley um, and Elizabeth Kinson Hasty and Megan McCarty uh, for the, all the hard work that went into uh, making this luncheon possible and the hospitality possible. So thank you all for uh,
Political speech is often careless and ideologically driven. Terms like the rich, the elite, the poor, the middle class are tossed about loosely and sometimes deceptively. Neither politicians nor preachers, for that matter, despite all their chatter, ever seem to touch on the actual human experience of gay violence. The true devastation worked by a hurricane or a tsunami, for example, has much more to do with the loss of place and of friends and shared experience than it does with the financial value of houses and cars. And at the opposite end, we seldom hear serious consideration of the new forms of economic slavery experienced by high income and high consumption, dual career suburban families with two fast track jobs, two SUVs, and two children at soccer camp. As for scriptures, frequent directions concerning possessions, they are so bewilderingly diverse and even contradictory that virtually any practice with regard to possessions can be justified by scripture. At one extreme, we can claim scriptural support for radical poverty, but we have nothing or a community of possessions where no one calls anything their own. At the other extreme, proponents of the prosperity gospel swear that they are the most faithful to the Bible. Jesus was rich and wants us to be rich. If that's Jesus coming, <laughs> surprised them, that when we seriously ask of ourselves or each other what we should do with our stuff, or how our faith in God should lead us to a faithful use of possessions, we find little clarity. Most of us muddle along through our economic lives in a fog of concern and confusion and guilt. We are concerned. We want to do the right thing. But we are confused. If we send relief to the victims of the hurricane, whatever name, can we also help the earthquake victims in whatever place as well? And if we do either, can we afford to buy our kids the shoes? that our kids need. And we feel guilty for the needs and the pleas keep coming. And we literally do not know how to think, or to feel, or to act in a way that makes sense to our faith. Now my purpose in this presentation is to try to improve our talk possessions in the church by improving the way we think about possessions. A way of thinking that doesn't betray either the witness of scripture or the experience of our own lives. I promise not to provide an answer to the question, what should we do? Told Megan last night, I was not going to answer this question, and I'm not going to answer this question. For I don't think that that question is possible to answer once for all, and that's part of what I want to get to in this presentation. Instead, I want to propose a way of thinking theologically that might provide a framework for the discernment of our faith with respect to money and the stuff it buys 
and everything that we dare to call our own. My basic approach to this question has changed very little over the more than 40 years I have devoted to thinking about it. I remain deeply indebted to the French existentialist, Catholic philosopher and playwright, Gabriel Marcel. In a series of brilliant studies, including such titles as Being and Having, The Mystery of Being, and Creative Fidelity, Marcel put forward an absolutely critical distinction between thinking about problems and reflecting on mystery. What are problems? As Marcel observes, problems lie outside us and are potentially solvable. A broken toy, a burnt out fuse, an algebraic equation, a budget. In these areas, clear-headed and objective analysis and detachment are required. Don't be fuzzy-headed about electrical connections. Now this way of thinking is very much privileged in our world. In fact, some of us think it's the only way of thinking, problem solving. But Marcel reminds us, a lot of our human lives has to do with realities that don't just lie outside us, but very much involve us and our bodies. In these matters, we can't detach ourselves and pretend that we can be objective about them without falsifying both them and ourselves. These matters are what Marcel calls the realm of mystery. Our personal relationships, to take the most obvious example, are not problems to be solved, but mysteries to be engaged and celebrated and suffered. And such engagement requires a more complex form of thinking than that used for problem solving. We are seriously confused when we treat our marriage as a problem and our budget as a mystery. <laughs> now, we can't make any progress at all if we don't acknowledge that possessions occupy a particularly difficult place between the realms of the problematic and the mysterious. Getting, keeping, growing our stuff requires plans and projects and an abundance of pragmatic calculation. But our relationship to our stuff involves us in mystery. How we link what we have with who we are. How our sense of self-worth connects to the worth of our portfolio. How I measure myself by the number and importance of my friends. All these go far beyond balancing our checkbook. Matters that cut so close to the bone of our individual and communal sense of identity as being and having that demand using language as slippery as that attaching to words like rich and poor that inevitably involve not only our minds but also our tangled emotions of longing and desire and fear 
and regret that call into question finally even the condition of our fragile physical existence. <laughs> In these matters, simple solutions are always inadequate. So when we discuss possessions or power or sexuality, it's impossible to detach ourselves from our own bodily commitments, past and present. We, we can't distance ourselves without distorting ourselves. We can't pretend that we don't have any stake in the analysis. Each of us brings to such discussions our own tangled tales of hope and disappointment, of fear and longing. Now this, this should not cause us to despair. Just the opposite. Our discussion is enriched and enlivened by the multiple perspectives that each one of us brings to it. If our discussion thereby becomes more complex and murky, then we are closer to the truth. But the truth is that we are all involved in a mystery of existence and non-existence, of being and having a res as resistant and complex and murky as our very bodies. These subjects touch on the truth of our somatic and spiritual beings. Now, you may remember that I've already said how scripture <coughs> contains many prescriptions concerning possessions, and that by picking and choosing among them, we might be able to claim a biblical basis for almost any position. But this isn't entirely true. What is true is that first, scripture consistently connects the human use of possessions to the basic drama of idolatry and faith in which all humans are players in response to God and God's world. And second, scripture consistently rejects some uses of possessions while being inconsistent in advocating others. In simple terms, scripture is clear on what it rejects less clear on what it recommends. In every way, the law, the prophets, the writings of the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, the Gospels, and the letters of Paul, and the letter of James, directly connect the use of possessions to covenantal faith the one God. Faith in God demands certain ways of using possessions. The opposite of such faith, called idolatry, leads to quite different uses of possessions. A far greater importance than the Bible's specific commands concerning possessions, I conclude, is the premise underlying all of its commands. Namely, that grasping for possessions is the expression of idolatry. The sharing of possessions is both the expression and the symbol of faith. To make sense of this, we must acknowledge, together with Cynthia's sermon this morning, which was right up on this point, that what scripture means by faith is much, much more than simple belief, which could be just a matter of the mind. 
as the letter of James says, you believe that God has won so do the demons, and they shudder. Faith, in the full scriptural sense, is a response of the whole person to the living God. That involves belief, to be sure, but also trust and obedience and perseverance. Sharing our possessions, then, is the expression of faith in God. Because faith demands of us everything that we are and everything that we have. Faith begins by the recognition that all that we are and all that we have is irreducibly a gift from God, given at every moment and never completely in our control. And since faith sees ourselves as gifted, the logic of faith is to share that gift with others. Idolatry, in contrast, is much, much more than worshiping the wrong gods or putting the incense in front of statues. Idolatry is a disease of the human spirit that begins with the refusal to acknowledge that our very being is a gift. Idolatry seeks to establish our existence and worth on the basis of our own efforts and must logically use possessions as a means of asserting, supporting, defending, growing ourselves. We are what we have, says idolatry. The more we have, the more we are. The less we have, the less we are. Now notice that this is not simply a matter of houses and cars and uh, bank accounts and, and retirement portfolios. It's a matter of friends, ideas, energy, time, prestige, virtue. All of these can be things that we cling to and claim as making ourselves secure in the world and before God. The logic of idolatry, therefore, involves envy and competition, leading to mutual elimination. It sees life as a zero-sum game in which it is necessary that if one has more, another must have less. In its negative form, therefore, the mandate of faith is clear and consistent. Faith forbids all acquisitiveness, greed. Indeed, the letter of the Ephesians calls acquisitiveness idolatry. Avoid that acquisitiveness which is idolatry. Therefore, all of Scripture consistently and emphatically forbids stealing and fraud and oppression and perverting justice, bribing judges, moving landmarks, withholding of wages, neglecting of widows and orphans and soldiers. Scripture is unequivocal on all this. No, 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 no. In contrast, the modes of sharing possessions in Scripture are far more various. And it's this side of things that is always intrigued. Why so definite on one side and yet so vague on the other side? The vagueness and the 
open-endedness of a mandate to share possessions, I have come to think, is connected directly to the open-ended character of faith in the living God. God moves ahead of us in all the circumstances of our lives and calls us to respond in those specific and ever-changing circumstances. Our every human instinct is idolatrous. We don't want to be open-ended. We don't want to answer the phone. We want to identify our being with our having. We want to close. We want to stop. We want to protect our own projects and possessions. But God calls us to a larger and more frightening space, God's own creation, revealed to us in the others that we encounter every day. When we obey the call of faith, we open ourselves to God as God is disclosed to us through God's creation. And we let go for that moment of our projects and possessions by which we seek to define ourselves. We experience the thrill and the terror of freedom. Yet, characteristically, we no sooner do we enter into that open space than we begin to fence it all around and furnish it according to our taste. Some curtains would look nice here. Now, here's where I'm going to put my boxes, turning God's call and gift into our project and possession. Now, as you might have surmised from this brief sketch, I've begun to think of Luther's famous phrase, Simul justus et peccato, at once righteous and a sinner. Not in static terms, as though we always remain sinners and somehow God passes over that and declares us righteous, but rather as a dynamic process in which we always respond to God's gift and yet always turn it into our project. The gift that we call grace, and you remember that the word grace means gift, is always from God's side. Through the intrusion, the interruption of our projects by others. Gets to us by each other. The big O other gets to us through the little O others. That's where it happens. On our side, we constantly try to fit that gift into a frame that we can control. All right. I respond to God, I'm going to be a monk, said I at the age of 19. I can control that, and then God's gift interrupted that through the intrusion of my wife Joy, and so I leave the monastery and respond to that call, and then um, I make a new project out of being a great father and you know I, six children I inherited they were somebody else's problem I felt pretty good about solving problems other people had created <laughs> <laughs> and then my daughter my biological daughter uh, I discovered that I was the problem and so that was a whole different kind of situation but the, the this process by which you want to be a great scholar, you want to write a book, and your daughter is calling from the other room, Daddy, come play with me. And you, you, you don't know which way to go. If we 
attended only to our tendency toward idolatry, we would despair. Our hope lies not in ourselves, but in the fact that our faith is in the living God, who constantly gives us, through others, because God remains always the surprising other beyond our control. Between faith professed, therefore, and faith enacted lies discernment. God's call comes to us in constantly changing circumstances which, we do, which, which resist prediction and control. For faith to be truly obedient, that is, creatively loyal to the one calling us, it must discern in the constantly altering face of real life the appropriate way for faith to respond. This is the perilous and terrifying freedom of faith. We never know whether our specific response is right. All we can ever do is trust that our way of responding is righteous. Now what this means for the faithful disposition of possessions, I think, should be pretty clear. The mandate of faith is, in the most proper sense, to symbolize faith itself. Faith needs to be embodied in ever-changing ways of response to the call of God. Such an embodied response in physical action is not symbolic in some weakened sense of the term, but in the fullest sacramental sense, it affects what it signifies. Acquisitiveness, greed, oppression, these all obviously symbolize and enact the response of idolatry, but every open-handed sharing of possessions equally enacts and signifies the very essence of faith. It's quite possible for us, if we are asked what is faith, to answer it is the sharing of our possessions. <coughs> I want to devote the final section of this formal presentation to a series of propositions, theses, T-H-E-S-E-S. -E -E <laughs> Although you can make your own judgment. <laughs> a series of propositions in the hope to perhaps stimulate some conversation and questions uh, that you might have or observations on this most important subject. One, there's 14 of them, but don't worry. The, you know, some of them are real short. <laughs> You know, I was always told that the worst thing you can do rhetorically is announce to people how many points you're going to have. Because everybody's all here to, okay, when, when are we going to get there, you know? Uh, so, first, <laughs> because of the way we're constituted as spiritual somatic creatures, we are inevitably caught in the paradoxical condition of both being and having. We truly have no choice as to whether we are to possess, because we both are and have our bodies. Our only choice is how we are to possess and how we are to share. Second, the way we dispose of our possessions is the expression of our spiritual commitments just as the disposition of our bodies expresses the desires of our heart. Third, this is one of the key points that I really would like to take away from this. Our possessions encompass far more than material things. They include our time, space, ideas, dreams, emotions, vision, Projects, spiritual status, whatever we might claim as mine, 
before ours. Fourth, the living God we encounter as the other, as we meet every day all those who are others in our lives, calls us out of the bondage of idolatry, where we are trapped by our own compulsion to control, into the astonishing gift of freedom, where we neither can control uh, or own, but are rather caught up in a perilous and liberating power, not our own. Fifth, our idolatrous impulse to self-determination, expressed by our identifying our being with our having, becomes sinful rather than idolatrous. We're created as idolaters. But it becomes sinful when we consciously refuse God's call to us through the needs of others by making an absolute claim on our possessions and those of others. I hope I'd be happy to talk more about this point. But we're, we're naturally idolaters because we don't we don't molt, we don't migrate, we don't, we don't, we're not, in, we're not, uh, we have freedom, and, and therefore that's perilous, and we need to put stuff around ourselves because we're going to die. So that's very natural to us, to want to cling to what we have, to make what we have who we are. That's not sin. Sin is when the call comes to us through the needs of others, and we say no. Six, obedient faith in the living God means, in effect, loosening our hold on what is ours, whether money or time or space or ideas or reputation or self-image or even our own notion of what faith demands and allowing these possessions to be relativized by God's project revealed through the needs of others. Seven, the specific way in which this obedient faith in God is acted out is in our response to those others we encounter in our lives and in the needs, projects, desires, demands that they have that intersect and thereby relativize our own. Eight, here's the second major. The response of faith is never once for all. It is a lifelong series of responses to God who constantly moves ahead of us as the living God. Therefore, it is contrary to the nature of obedient faith to expect a single, once for all, disposition of our possessions that needs never be challenged or changed. Nine. Although the mandate of faith, which forbids the idolatrous clinging to possessions, deriving from envy, fear, compulsion, greed, and covetousness is absolute, <coughs> the symbolization of faith in the positive sharing of possessions must always remain relative to the character of the circumstances in which God calls. To be precise, the mandate is absolute but the mode of its enactment is relative to circumstances. Ten, the role of discernment in the faithful dispositions of possessions is critical. For if such sharing is to be determined not by our projects, but by the needs of others, then those needs must properly be assessed in qualitative as well as quantitative terms. Only spiritual discernment can make faith truly obedient, which is to say, truly creative, flexible, and open to the God who calls. Eleven. Only, only three more to go. <laughs> <laughs> We're rounding the turn. <clears throat> Actually, for people in Louisville, I shouldn't use those terms. <laughs> <laughs> First turn, second turn, stretch, back, kick down, all that. Eleven. The sharing of possessions, that is the symbolization of living faith, 
must always maintain some face-to-face -face and personal contact with those with whom possessions are being shared. Otherwise, the sharing simply becomes a rigid program to which we are committed and may no longer respond to the real needs of those we are serving. Twelve. Since we are embodied creatures who are also thereby inevitably social creatures, the way we gather ourselves socially into intentional communities, like church, has the same symbolic dimension as it does for individuals. This means that for Christians, the faithful sharing of possessions is not simply a matter of individual faith, but must express the faith of the community as well. 13. What was said in the previous points about the faith of the individual therefore applies as well to the church. It has no choice concerning whether or not it possesses, but only how much it possesses and how it uses those possessions. Likewise with the other points, the church's possessions include more than financial resources but also intellectual and spiritual resources. The call of faith demands on the negative side the refusal to identify the church's identity on the basis of possessions or on their acquiring. And on the positive side, faith demands the sharing of all possessions. The modes of the church's sharing are determined by the discernment of the community. And such discernment focuses not on the self-image of the church, but on the needs of others. Demanding, therefore, a constant attention and face-to-face -face engagement with those others. Fourteenth, and this is the last of the points. It's not the end of the paper, it's the last one. What most distinguishes the faithful sharing of possessions by a church community from the faithful sharing by individual believers is the complexity of life together. Decisions must be made. Organization is required. This means on one side that spontaneity is lessened. On the other side, it makes the constant practice of discernment and the personal knowledge of those being served all the more necessary for the inertia of community self-serving is a, most, a more constant danger. In this presentation, I've tried to suggest some of the elements that I think must go into any theological reflection. The careful consideration of the normative text by which we live, and the equal attention to the circumstances and the experiences of human life. By paying attention to both, we can derive certain principles that can guide our thinking and our action. Such principles are themselves naturally far too broad to constitute a definite program of action, especially one that we could institute and then forget. And that may be the most important conviction I want to share with you today. The one thing we most want is to be able to organize our life so that it doesn't require our presence. We do not want to constantly review our projects. We do not want to have them challenged. We want an answer that we can put in our pocket as a possession so that we can have the comfort and security that we are doing the right thing. We want to write a check for a worthy cause and have a bumper sticker saying that we did. But precisely here is where our desire and God's desire seem to be most in conflict. Apparently, our comfort and security in being right is very low on God's agenda. And 
now I'm going to use the same passage that Cynthia used uh, in the sermon this morning. In one of Scripture's most dramatic passages, Prophet Micah proposes a number of once-for-all projects that might please God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn child for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. And the prophet answers, He has showed you, humans, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, walk humbly with your God. God, it appears, does not require of us a present. But God desires our presence, which is the only gift that is distinctively ours to give to God. By giving it each moment to each other. Thank you. Some of us, at some times, 
it doesn't touch at all what the reality of aging, which is both fascinating and horrifying as we go through it. And, and um, my favorite line in that chapter is, the world leaves us before we leave the world. And, and I think that's almost a universal experience, uh, that as we age, we find the world around us stranger and stranger. Um, and, you know, whatever happened to all the people I worked with, and all the people I knew, and the music I loved, and the art I loved, and the literature I loved, all of a sudden, we're old and alone, in one way or another. And this is a really important locus for the church to learn theologically by paying attention to the stories of those who are aging. And, and because, above all, with aging, because we have no Christological witness to growing old in the Lord. Right? Our Messiah dies young and violently. Um, and so we have to learn from the saints. We have to learn from the, the saints among us. What does, what does it mean to remain faithful to the Lord to the end of your days? What does it mean to die in the Lord? And so that's kind of what I was getting at. And, and, and to say that, well, everything's in Scripture, it's not. There's a whole lot that's not in Scripture, and it's really, really important theologically. Um, and like on the passions, you know, uh, Scripture, like much of ancient philosophy, was totally down on desire and passion um, and pleasure. Well, hell, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, these are these are these are the this is what drives us to greatness if we're going to be great. It's the fact that we that 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 fantasy drives us forward and pleasure in what we do, um, and it's important to pay attention to that. So that's thank you. Yeah, I don't have that book for sale, but that's the one you ought to buy. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I'm struck with uh, your comment about our, what we possess is more than, not less than our financial resources, but also more than. Yes. And also what those financial resources represent. Yeah. Um, so in another sort of world of conversation, some of us talk about around here is the whole concept of white privilege and the notion that some of us have privileges that just we got by virtue of being born who we were, where we were, when we were. And we don't even notice that stuff. It, it's, hard to, it's hard to get to notice that. But we're being asked to think about that in our world. It's 
not a politically correct argument, it's a theological argument, that God gives us through otherness. Now, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre said, you know, l'enfer et l'autre, right? Hell is the other person. Uh, and that may apply to your children or mine. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to reverse that other way. That the other is the way in which God gifts us. Okay, so how does God gift us in this particular case? It is through my hospitality of somebody who is truly other than my particular set you know, of, of gifts and possessions and so forth. Now what's tricky here is that, and I think here where Henry Nowen is so good on I mean, his little book on hospitality, you know, that we misconstrue hospitality if we think, okay, I'm open to the other, and therefore the whole point is what I give to the other. But the real point of hospitality for Nowen is how the other gives me or us. That, you know, that and, and that in a way is, of course, a gift to them. You know, that, that to, to be able to gift us. And so I, I think that in almost any endeavor, um, if, if our conversation is totally homogeneous, whether it's in terms of ethnicity, whether, as very often in the church, it's in terms of class or uh, economic status, um, we are going to be deprived. And others are going to be deprived because of that. Because there's certain things that we just never see. Uh, and, yeah, I think that's. Is that responsive to your question? Um, it's, it's, it really is, I think, fundamental to me that the other who is God gets to us through the others, and that those others, uh, I mean, I, I find it very strange that people want to marry people like themselves. I find that a very strange proposition. I mean, nobody could be more different than my wife and me. We could divide up the salad bar between us, and, you know, divide up the New York Times between us, right? <clears throat> we could divide up good taste and bad taste between us. Uh, and, but we learn from each other over the 40 plus years of being together precisely because of that difference. You know, so I think I, I would take the quest for homogeneity to be a reflection of idolatry. It's the desire to be in control. It's the desire to be in a safe space. You know, it's the desire to, you know, not want to be threatened by difference. And of course, one of the things we forget is hospitality to ideological differences. Hospitality to differences in views and differences in in approaches to life, in differences in ideas. This is just as important as other forms uh, of diversity. Now, Cynthia's question must have opened up the floodgates. Yes, sir. I, I suspect this could be the subject of a second presentation, so um, answer is... But it won't be as good as my response. <laughs> what's, the, what's the relationship between sharing possessions and the what do we learn and experience about who we are and what we have that is in The first thought that I had uh, after 9-11, uh, when I had a chance to move beyond shock to thinking, was to think about all those Italian boys and girls from Queens who joined the police corps, the police corps, and the fire department. Went to mass their whole lives without ever thinking about, this is my body given for you. And yet, it was <coughs> deeply inscribed in their entire, you know, in their entire being. 
no thinking it through, no analysis. It is where there is need to go. And I think the Eucharist is the supreme teacher of that. When we you know, think about the sharing of God's own life with us through the death of Jesus, the body and the blood of Jesus, and our sharing of that, the point of it is not a kind of intellectual lesson. It's a, it, is, it is really you know, like what Ignatius of, uh, of uh, Antioch you know, called the you know, medicine that's, that we take to change us, to transform us. So that, I mean, this is, this is one of the lessons I learned from my wife, who was a daily communicant her whole life. And, you know, when, whenever there was any situation of crisis, Joy, who was five feet tall, a tiny little bit, would run out in front, right, to face the danger instead of me and our dog. And I, I often thought about this, you know, my daughter and I are very heady, right? So if someone's pointing a gun at us, we say, is it loaded? <laughs> Can it shoot straight? Is he serious, right? Joy had, was immediately in action, right? To put her body between that danger and us. And that's, I think that's what Eucharist does. Um, I think it is, the supreme example of sharing possessions, if you will, right? Uh, where God's own life is shared with us. Now you don't have to go to the second. Right? <laughs> Could you say a bit about how Jesus addressed idolatry, and not just with possessions, but the other kind of idolatry? So what, 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 what do we take from Jesus about how we should I don't think that, uh, in my view, it's not so much what Jesus said. What do we learn from Jesus about the issue of idolatry? And what has struck, you know, I think what we learn from Jesus is the, the, the character of his, of his existence. That, um, you know, the, the gesture of this is my body given for you, this is my body put out for you, and and the body language of the cross, right? The Son of Man came to give his life. Um, is expressed verbally by, you know, I want to live, but Father, your will be done, not mine. The existence of Jesus as we see it in the gospel narratives is one of constantly responding to needs of others rather than his own projects. I mean, the classic instance that you well know as a scholar of the Gospel of Mark is the is the, the case where Jesus is beset upon by people's needs and he says to his disciples, let's go have a picnic, you know, and let's cross over the lake and, you know, because I they, they want to rest. That's a perfectly legitimate project. That's I want to live. And he looks up and the crowd is coming toward him, you know, and uh, the gospel writer says, you know, spontaneous place, he was moved with compassion. I think in that case, probably the variant reading, or east face, he was moved with anger, was probably psychologically more plausible. But that's a, a small example of, you know, uh, when people needed liberation, he reached out to them. When they needed healing, he reached out to them. When they needed to be fed with teaching, he responded. So the, the whole life was one of exactly what I'm trying to describe. And so it, it's not what he said. I mean, you don't get it in the Sermon on the Mount, really. What about the, what about the consider the lilies of the field? You know, in terms of putting your existence in God and not. Well, that's right. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, that, the, you know, that where, where your treasure is, your heart is, right? And, and um, and, and so, you know, uh, he, in the passage in Luke 12, for example, where uh, the, the commandment not to lay up treasures for yourself and not, 
He says, because your father's already given you the kingdom, right? What is that kingdom? It's the participation in, in the God's gifts of creation. So, uh, to me, Jesus is the supreme uh, example of faith's freedom. Because if, if you read the Gospels, I mean, number one, in comparison with every notable figure in antiquity, Jesus stands out as being uh, touchable, uh, accessible. Nobody pays any attention to children in the ancient world. They didn't pay any attention to children until the end of the 19th century. Um, Jesus, you know, calls them over, says, come here, honey, bunch, and, you know, holds them and, and, and teaches from them. People could touch him. Um, lepers could touch him. Hemorrhaging women could touch him. It's astonishing. So there's that, you know, and, and you know, the Robert Schutz in the Rule of Taizé says, Tantisponomilitae equipes sacred calcium continue well to the point of arts, not mark a time of powerful. Your availability implies a continual simplification of your existence, not through compulsion, but through faith. And, and Jesus had that simplicity. When you read the Gospels, you never have the sense that he had something better to do than what he was doing. So, you know, it was like, uh, he couldn't be interrupted because the interruptions were the point. I don't know if that's... You got to... So the, uh, 
Life is more exciting if lived in connection with the body and its desires and its drives. And let the mind work with them. But don't keep them under such control that they have to break out and go shoot somebody. I'm being dismissed. <laughs>